I think we could get started. Again, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian Wilkie. I'm going to uh, try to explain to you how liquid crystal displays work. Right now, I'm the, uh, the VP of engineering for North America at US Microproducts. So let's start by taking a look at what we're going to go through. I'm going to talk a little bit about US Microproducts, uh, about all the layers in the LCD stack. And then we're going to take a closer look at the operation of the uh, liquid, liquid, liquid crystal section itself. We'll go through a few of the different technologies that are available in uh, LCDs and, uh, and then some of the different semiconductor technologies that are, are used. Then we'll finish by looking at how much light we have to put in the back to get a decent uh, bright and uh, colorful display at the front. So let me start by explaining a little bit about US Microproducts. We're a display manufacturer that develops and delivers displays for demanding applications. So we're not a pure engineering house. We only uh, make money when we have uh, satisfied customers that, are, uh, that, that we're shipping displays for their end products. We do more than uh, 200 display designs a year a lot of them are in very inhospitable environments. So uh, we have a lot more experience than your engineering team probably has in terms of all the different nuances of display technology. And uh, we have a team here in the US and a team in uh, Taichung, Taiwan, that uh, focuses on the, uh, the engineering of uh, displays. We've been around for 25 years, uh, so we're not just uh, we're not just a startup. We've been around for a while. We have a, a pretty good uh, program management system called DevStar that we use to keep everything coordinated across the uh, across the oceans and uh, make sure that we're uh, we're shipping something that meets or exceeds and we prefer to exceed our customer requirements. And, uh, and we, uh, we actually deliver them on time, which recently, as you're all aware, has been uh, somewhat challenging, but we're, uh, we're, doing, uh, we're doing pretty well. So we like to think that our display expertise can, uh, can really help your engineering team deliver the best display, which is the most visible part of, of your product. So enough about us. Uh, let's talk about the uh, the TFT stack, all the layers that go into making one of these things work. So we start off with uh, two layers of glass in the LCD cell itself, and I'll go into more detail on that in a few minutes. With another layer of glass with a color filter on top of it, and. Uh, You'll have to uh, put up with me. I spell things the British way. So please don't tell me that color is spelled C-O-L-O-R. That's just not right. Uh, so three layers of glass so far. We, uh, in order to make these things work, we need a couple of polarizers, one below and uh, one above the display. Uh, interestingly enough, that top polarizer is at right angles to the, the bottom polarizer. And uh, those of you that have played with sunglasses will realize that that doesn't let any light go through. And that's where the LCD cell comes into play. But you can't use an LCD display unless you've got uh, a backlight. And that's, uh, that's an assembly with a row of LCDs along one edge and then some, uh, uh, some pretty specialized light guides and diffusers that give you even white illumination across the entire screen. So that's the, uh, the source of the light, which is then modulated, modified by the LCD cell and the other layers. And then to protect 
things from the uh, the outside world, which is pretty hazardous in uh, in a lot of our customers' conditions. We have a cover lens, and uh, that cover lens typically has uh, an anti glare or anti reflection layer or a uh, coating on top, and then the uh, the bezel around the display. And often a customer's logo is printed on the underside. So it's only a glass surface that's uh, exposed to the outside world. Of course, in many applications, we, uh, we need touch capability. So we, uh, we often add another layer of glass, which is the touch sensor. It's printed with uh, transparent conductive electrodes usually in a diamond pattern, which uh, allow you to detect uh, a finger or, uh, or some other object coming close to the glass. We, uh, we join them all together with uh, typically with something called optical bonding. And optical bonding is a very specialized glue that, uh, that has the characteristic of having the exact same refractive index as the glass that's on either side of it. And because the refractive index is the same, there's no reflection at that interface between the glue and the glass. Uh, because internal reflect reflections, which you can get if you, if you build the thing with, uh, with an air gap, these internal reflections allow sunlight if you're outdoors to bounce back and forward, uh, which robs the display of, uh, of contrast. So we really like uh, optical bonding. It also helps to build a, a pretty strong assembly by, uh, by gluing everything nicely together. So that's the TFT stack, lots of layers, each with a very specialized uh, physics and chemistry and functionality. So let's look at the LCD cell layers themselves. First thing we do is we take a large sheet of glass, uh, typically uh, one to several meters in, uh, in area. We add a thin layer of silicon and then we pat pattern that, that silicon into transistors. We, uh, we then cut it to the size of the display with the semiconductors on the underside. So there's our first layer, those uh, semiconductors and, uh, and the, the conductors connecting them make up the pixels and subpixels of, of the display itself. So each pixel is three portions, a red, a green, and a blue portion. We have to treat the, the top surface of that glass so that liquid crystals on, uh, on the inside of the display align parallel to that lower polarizer. We then take a second sheet of glass. We coat it with a transparent electrode on top and then go ahead and treat the underside to align crystals at right angles to that lower glass. We add some spacers that keep the layers apart and then we seal the edges and fill it with liquid crystal displays. So that's the LCD cell, two layers of glass, lots of semiconductors, and a liquid crystal material. So how does that all work? Oh, by the way, we let's not forget to add a color filter to create those red, green, and blue pixels. And then we attach a flexible circuit with an integrated circuit on it that, uh, that can address the rows and columns of transistors on the display itself to give them a charge. And that flexible circuit was a bit beyond my artistic capability. So I, I didn't put that in the picture, I apologize. So the first form of uh, LCDs was uh, 
was known as the twisty, Twisted Pneumatics, or TN, display technology. And the liquid crystals themselves are like rods. They're linear. They have a positive charge at one end, a negative charge at the other end. And we talked about the surface treatment of that bottom layer. And it is used to align the crystals at the bottom with the bottom polarizer. The crystals at the top align with that surface treatment. This time they're at right angles and parallel to the top polarizer. And then the layers in between just sort themselves neatly because of uh, negative charges being attracted to positive charges. They align themselves neatly, but because you've got 90 degrees twist in there, they form a nice spiral that's twisted through 90 degrees. So what happens is that light comes through the, uh, from the backlight, polarized in one direction by, the, uh, by the, that bottom polarizer. And then the twisted layers of the liquid crystal twist that light to match the top polarizer. So the light actually gets through, works just fine without power. However, once we power things up, we can apply a charge to an individual pixel or subpixel from the semiconductor layer. And what happens then is that charge attracts the positive end of each of the liquid crystals. You'll see this particular display is very slow in, uh, in responding. I guess I need to speed up my animation here. But once those crystals are aligned, the light is no longer twisted. So it hits the top polarizer, which is at right angles to the way the light is polarized, and the pixel goes dark. So by playing with the charge on the, uh, on the transistors in the, uh, in the matrix, we can actually play with lightening and darkening each pixel and subpixel independently. So there are some problems with that uh, TN technology. And uh, if, if any of you uh, remember flying about mm, 10 years ago, there were displays on the back of the aircraft seat and you could never watch the movie that, uh, the, the person on the other side of the aisle was watching because the once you look at one of these displays from a pretty acute angle, you, you get light spilling from one pixel into the next pixel, which is a different color. And so when you're looking at those displays from a, a shallow angle, you, uh, you see lots of video artifacts, colors reversing, things going dark, things going bright. It's not very nice. So viewing one of these TN displays from the wrong, long angle is uh, it's not a good experience. Luckily, we came up with better technology than that. And we call that in-plane switching or IPS. And in, this time, we have the two polarizers aligned the same way. But this, the same kind of surface treatment is used and, uh, and that causes the liquid crystals to align at, at right angles. And so the light comes through that bottom polarizer, sees the liquid crystals acting as a polarizer that's 90 degrees out of phase and no light gets through. So luckily we have two electrodes in each of the subpixels independently controlled by the electronics. And when they carry an opposite charge, crystals 
get twisted to align with the polarizer and light gets through. And the nice, nice thing about this version is that you have a very wide viewing angle in IPS technology. It also, it's also nice because it's faster in response time, which if you're into gaming is very important. Uh, it has those wide viewing angles and it's also easier to get more levels of brightness and uh, therefore more colors from this type of display. But let's talk a little bit about what all those thin film transistors actually do. So here's a, we've stepped back from the display. We're looking at the uh, electronics. In the graphics controller on the main board of your application, there's a memory that holds the digital value that you want to be in each of those pixels. In fact, it's, uh, it's three digital values, one for red, one for green, and one for blue. And then there's a flexible circuit that takes the, uh, the signals up to the timing controller and the timing controller drives column drivers and gate drivers. And then in the display itself, in the, uh, in the silicon that's actually coated onto the display, there's a transistor and a capacitor at each of the intersections of the gate the gate lines and the column drivers. So what happens is that the timing controller tells the, the first row gate driver to turn on. And then each of the, the column drivers, while that is turned on, pulses electricity through electrons through the, uh, each of the column drivers if the column driver is on for a long period of time, you get a lot of charge. If it doesn't turn on at all, you get no charge and you can, you can char store charge at many in intermediate levels. So that gives you, that takes the data for the first row of uh, display that's in the graphics controller and it converts it actually to an analog voltage on that capacitor on each of the, uh, the sub pixels in the display. Then the electronics goes ahead and energizes the second row of information. And those column drivers pulse again for a time that's determined by the, the brightness that you want on that pixel. And uh, another set of charges is fed into the second row of the display. And the timing controller goes through all of those, all of the rows in the display to set up the complete picture you want to display. And the capacitor acts as a memory cell to keep that charge on there until the next time that the display is refreshed. So, what you've got is a, a form of analog memory driving each of the sub pixels in the display. So let's talk a little bit about the semiconductor technology that goes into all of that, this. For, uh, for normal integrated circuits, we actually build them on slices of a single crystal of silicon. And the nice thing about single crystals is that electrons can move very easily. They're very mobile in, uh, in a crystal like that. And so we can build very small transistors and have them operate really fast. So that's how uh, the main processors are built in uh, things like your cell phone. However, the amorphous silicon that we use for, uh, for a lot of displays, the transistors are pretty slow and pretty large. And because they're not transparent, the ratio of transparent pixel to transistor that's driving the pixel isn't so good. 
So not as much light gets through as you would like. On the other hand, the, they only take four or five masking layers or uh, production steps to, uh, to build. So they're relatively inexpensive uh, to build. Newer technology is, uh, is called low, low temperature polysilicon. And uh, that's, uh, that's actually polycrystalline silicon. So there are, there are crystals in there uh, that allows the transistors to be much faster and significantly smaller. And you can either use that for making a brighter display or you can use it for making more pixels on a given size of display. So uh, if you want to have a, a really good uh, video, then you want something around about 200 pixels per inch, per linear inch of display. And LTPS allows you to do things like that. However, they, can, they need up to 11 masking layers. So uh, twice as many manufacturing steps to build them. And those are pretty expensive tools. So they, uh, you, you get higher costs with LTPS technology. The third one, which is becoming more popular is something called IGZO. And IGZO stands for Indium Gallium Zinc Oxide. And uh, that's, uh, that mouthful, it's much easier stated as IGZO. Uh, allows you to build transistors that have electron mobility somewhere in between the early amorphous and the LTPS. And uh, so you get really nice small transistors with small interconnect between the transistors, allowing you to get brighter displays. It only takes five to seven masks. So I... Uh, intermediate performance speed-wise and intermediate cost. And what's really nice about it is you get very low leakage. So those capacitors on the display can hold their charge for longer. And that allows you to have lower power consumption in the display electronics itself. It's worth noting, however, that the backlight uh, usually takes care of about 70% of the power consumption of the uh, overall display. So IGZO helps, but it's, uh, uh, it's not, it doesn't cure everything in terms of making very low power consumption. And talking about the, uh, the backlight, let's take a look at all of those layers again. And uh, if we're gonna make a display, we start off with a pretty bright backlight and we measure the brightness of displays in something called a nit. So the backlight output might start at about 2000 nits, but it has to go through that first polarizer. And unfortunately only about 43% of the light gets through that first polarizer because any light that's not polarized in the right direction gets uh, reflected back. So we're down to 43% of the, the light already. And then the LCD itself turned full on only lets a, about 45% of the light that hits it get through. So we're if you look at the, the chart on the, the left, the, uh, the brightness is falling pretty rapidly. And then it hits the color filter. In the case of green, that only allows about 30% of the, the light to get through. So we're, uh, we're getting rid of light pretty rapidly. Luckily, the second polarizer, because any pixel that's turned on already has the correct polarization to get uh, to get through that second polarizer, it lets through about eighty percent of the light, and then we get through, get into the touch sensor and optical bonding at ninety five and ninety nine percent, 
and then the cover lens. And so what we end up with is a backlight at 2000 nits only gives us 82 nits out the front. And uh, if, you, if you're trying to build a display for outdoor applications, then you're looking for something like a thousand nits out the front. And if you do the math on that, uh, only about 4% of the light we put in the back gets out the front. So it really is a miracle that any light gets through all those layer, layers at all. And turns out to be about 4% that, that makes the journey. So, Let me, uh, let me summarize for you. LCDs are really complex, multi-layer devices. You've got to understand physics, chemistry, and electronics, and then combine them in a way that, uh, that, that works well together. There are choices in the actual liquid crystal implementation that affect viewing angle and color resolution. The, uh, you also have to be careful that uh, you choose a liquid crystal that's suitable for the environment that you're operating in. Uh, for instance, if you're, uh, if you're doing a, a display for a snowmobile, then you want to use a liquid crystal formulation that isn't going to freeze when you, uh, when you hit snowmobile kind of uh, outdoor temperatures. So you've got to uh, pay a lot of attention to the, the liquid crystal implementation. The, the semiconductor te technology affects the speed, the resolution, the power consumption and the brightness. So got to make a careful choice there. And then every layer that you put in there impacts the brightness, the durability, and the, the cost. So uh, you've got to be uh, very careful about how you put that all together. And again, uh, the backlight is going to dominate the power consumption. But the way we look at it at US Microproducts is that the display is the window into the soul of your product. That's how your customer interacts with your product. And uh, it has to look good and stay looking good uh, for your, your product to look good. So it really is the window into the soul of your product. And it's a place where you have to make careful choices to, uh, to get the display that does justice to your end application. So choose a supplier for your display that understands these trade-offs and delivers a display that sets you apart from your competition. Give us a call. We understand this stuff. Okay. If you want to go put some questions in, I see I've got one already. So the first question is how do you how do you stay in that business so long? Uh, all the LEDs contain the same, same layers. What would the next or unique technology in the future for LCDs? Okay, let me answer that one live if I can find my mouse. Um, okay, Ignacio, the uh, the the next technology for LCDs is probably ultra low power LCDs, which are really useful for um, wearable displays, handheld devices. The, uh, you can actually set the refresh rate of the display down into one refresh per second rather than 60 refreshes per second. And that can sharply reduce the uh, uh, the power consumption of the overall display. Okay, a uh, question from uh, DR. Uh, how is the optical bonding done? How is the bonding cured? 
How do you make sure there are no gaps? Okay, there are a couple of different optical bonding technologies. There's a, a OCR, which is a, a, an optical, it's a liquid, and uh, you, uh, uh, you, you set up a dam around the edge of the, the display, you dispense that liquid into that, uh, that dam area, and then you, uh, you, you put down the, uh, uh, the, the second layer, or you actually bond the two layers together around the edge and then inject the, uh, the OCR in the, uh, in the top. And uh, you measure the amount of OCR that you're going in there very carefully. You make sure you've got a little bit of uh, overflow at, uh, at one side. Uh, to make sure that you've got that that filled without any gaps, and then there's two technologies to cure it. One of them is uh, UV light, and the other is thermal. So you you choose the the OCR to suit the uh, the layer that you're you're gluing, and whether it's accessible to UV light or not, or whether you prefer thermal. The other uh, method of joining is OCA, which is a, a film, and you lay that film down on one layer of glass and then uh, press the other layer on top of it and then, then cure it. So uh, Michael is asking, what about OLEDs? Well, I guess uh, we, we do do OLEDs. Uh, OLEDs are a topic for another webinar. So can I just put that down as a vote to have a, a webinar on OLED technology? Okay, DR is asking also, can I comment on air gap bonding, how it's done, uh, pros and cons, etc. Okay, air gap bonding is, is done usually with a, a double-sided VHB tape that's uh, that's placed around the edge of the display and then you uh, you you apply pressure on the second layer of glass to uh, to put them together um, air gap bonding is less expensive than uh, than OCR and OCA or uh, optical bonding uh, it's less expensive but uh, it's it causes or it allows for there to be inter internal reflections between the two layers of glass. And those internal reflections, if you're in a, particularly if you're in a brightly lit environment, really uh, serve to wash out the appearance of the display. So it gets that kind of misty, the blacks are no longer very black and so on. So, uh, and you also need to watch that you, uh, in cases where you have a large air gap, uh, you, you want to watch that there isn't a, a path for dust to gradually build up in between the layers of the displays. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay, Azar is asking with smaller displays, do you favor EXO technology? Uh, yes, there are a lot of reasons to, uh, uh, to go for EXO technology. Um, it's, uh, as long as it's, it's available in the display size that you're, uh, you're looking for, uh, then uh, that, that's a pretty good choice, particularly for uh, anything that's uh, small and, uh, and battery powered. William says, how many different types of liquid crystals are there? Uh, actually, I don't think I know the question, the answer to that question. Uh, I can get back to you, but I do know that uh, there's quite a number of them and they also uh, run through 
different specification levels in terms of, in particular, the, the temperatures that they will operate on. So um, things like automotive temperature ranges, you have to choose a specific flavor of liquid crystal to, uh, to get good performance. Okay, another answer, another question from uh, Michael on uh, the uh, VHB air gap style. Uh, is it easier to replace the touch sensor in the field? Uh, actually, it's not. The VHB is stands for very high bond strength, and it can be a, a pain to, uh, to actually disconnect. I know there are people who use uh, uh, foam gaskets and, uh, and pressure from the, um, the actual housing of the equipment to, to create the air gap. And uh, in, in, that, in that style, you usually end up with a much larger gap, which has implications for, for dust and, uh, uh, and loss of contrast. But uh, that kind of approach makes it uh, easier to replace the touch sensor. In general, uh, touch sensors are pretty reliable things. So... Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure that you really need to uh, worry about field replacement of the touch sensors unless you've got uh, a particularly nasty in environment. I've seen uh, some damage to sensors from uh, ESD, for instance. Okay, Jim is asking... Uh, he said he's seen some references to quantum wells to improve uh, contrast ratio. Um, actually, the the thing that uh, that that I've seen uh, most of is uh, using uh, nanoparticles to uh, improve the 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 color accuracy of displays. So when you get uh, white light, you uh, you really want it to be balanced equally between the red, green, and the blue, and that and to match well with the color filter. And uh, the the quantum effects of uh, nanoparticles can uh, can help improve the the color accuracy of the light coming. Uh, coming through the display and uh, and so you get a uh, much better much a much wider um, color gamut out the front so jim send me an email if i if i didn't answer your question there and i'll i'll try and do it, do it better with uh, with help from my friend, friends in the taichung team Okay, if my display has UV protection, how is that applied to the, the display? That's from, uh, from DR again. Okay, uh, so a couple of things with uh, UV protection. Uh, the thing that we see um, most, uh, most dangerous in, uh, in terms of UV, UV damage over the, the long term is uh, is on the outer layers of the display because uh, UV doesn't actually actually gets um, filtered reasonably well by glass, but the uh, the ink on the um, on the cover lens has to be very carefully chosen if you're uh, uh, if you're going to have a high UV environment. And so typically we recommend uh, a ceramic ink, which is actually baked into the inside surface of the, uh, of the cover lens glass to, uh, to make sure that, that that stuff lasts and lasts despite uh, very high UV environments. So that, that's the primary thing that we're careful of. 
in that space. Okay, uh, question from Gary. Uh, if the timing is controlled by the driver IC, isn't the display performance heavily dependent on the driver IC? How do you select the best driver IC? Actually, it's kind of the other way around, Gary. The, uh, you have to set up the driver IC to make the best of and to tolerate the capability of the transistors on the glass itself, those thin film transistors. So um, you, in the initialization of that uh, driver IC, you have to tell it what kind of transistors it, it has out there, what kind of refresh rate can they stand, uh, and, uh, and, and what kind of response curve do they have. So uh, usually it's the other way around. The driver IC is set up to do the best job it can with the display it's been asked to, uh, uh, to drive. So um, then the other thing you want to understand about the, the driver IC and the timing controller uh, is what interface do you want to the, the main computer board? So uh, is it LVDS uh, or, uh, or is it RGB, uh, you know, there, there are quite a few different interfaces and uh, you choose a driver IC that, that has the right bandwidth to handle the, uh, the data coming up from the, uh, from the main processor board, the graphics controller on there, and uh, how much bandwidth do you need for the amount of, uh, of information you're feeding onto the display. Okay, uh, Pat is asking, what's the maximum thickness for an automotive, an automotive display cover glass? Um, Brian Graham, if you want to answer this this one, uh, chime in. But uh, generally, uh, if you're using the chemically strengthened glass, there's a, there's a limit to how, how thick you can use, you can make uh, chem strength and glass. Uh, I think it's about uh, two millimeters. So, but Brian, do you wanna step in there? But, uh, I don't know of any specific specification around a uh, automotive glass, uh, cover glass as to how thick it needs to be or, or that. Usually it comes down to, you know, the how thick the device can be itself and what kind of uh, uh, ball drop test or test that you, you go into. So, you know, we have displays that go from anywhere from four to six millimeter thick uh, cover glass all the way down to uh, 0.7 or something like that. So it's really more dependent upon what you're putting it in and that kind of thing. But I don't, I'm not aware of any specific uh, requirement for automotive. Okay, uh, other options for using circular polarizer is another question from DR. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, having done any circular polarizer, but I think it's possible. Uh, can I get back to you on that one? And uh, I'm going to do one more question here, and uh, and then uh, wrap up because we've we've held you for about uh, forty five minutes here, and we'll uh, try and get back to the rest of you uh, with uh, with some answers. Okay, the uh, from Thomas, are there achievable temperature specification? Are the achievable temperature specifications fundamentally driven by the liquid crystals themselves? and uh, anything new to come to extend the temperature range? And the answer to that is, yeah, the liquid crystals are the main things that you, you need to worry about, but you also have to worry about the polarizer layers, 
they can be uh, damaged by um, high temperatures also, generally not low temperatures, but certainly high temperatures. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the specs on liquid crystals are gradually improving. And uh, we can certainly do minus 20 to plus 70 and uh, do that fairly often. Um, so uh, yes, they're, uh, they're getting better. I'm not sure that there's a fundamental technology. It's just better formulation and better control of the, uh, uh, of the processes to, to build the liquid crystals. Okay. I am going to run out of voice fairly soon. Uh, I'd really like to thank everybody for uh, hanging in there and, uh, and listening to all of this. I hope you found that uh, educational. And uh, if you have uh, needs for uh, displays in your products, please give us a call. We can help. <laughs>